Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the 11th Annual Planning in a Pint. Uh, my name's Sam. I'm the current president of the UWM Urban Planning Alumni Chapter. Um, planning in a Pint is our largest event of the year, so thank you all for attending again here in 2021. Typically, we listen um, all to a panel of speakers around a specific planning topic. Um, last January, for instance, we had a lively discussion around short-term rentals. With the pandemic, though, we thought it would be the perfect time to reach out and hear what some alumni have been up to across the country who aren't normally able to attend our Milwaukee-based planning in a pint. I'll let the presenters introduce themselves as we go along, but we hope you enjoy the meeting. Also, please stick around after the presentations uh, where we'll have some time for Q&A with our presenters and uh, maybe a second beer. This is a Zoom call where you know drinking is okay. Uh, that said, I'd like to take just a couple of minutes um, also for some thank yous before we get into our program. Um, firstly, thank you uh, to the UWM Alumni Association for their continued support of this event. They make it happen every year. Uh, special thanks to Kyle and Abigail for their behind the scenes help tonight. Uh, secondly, thanks to Good City Brewing uh, for their sponsorship this year and in previous years. Uh, we hope to be back there next year and in the meantime, Cheers. Uh, number three, uh, thanks again to Educators Credit Union for their generous sponsorship of tonight's event. Um, we're delighted to say that their support will go directly towards the Welford Sanders Scholarship, which aims to help minority students gain their master's in urban planning with the goal of making the urban planning profession more diverse, representative, and inclusive place. As we roll into tax time this year, in the next few months, uh, now is a great time to follow educators lead and make a contribution to the scholarship program if you are so inclined. Uh, before we begin, uh, let's hear a few words from Victor over at Educators. Great, thank you so much Sam, Sam for that great introduction. It's a great honor and we're actually thrilled to continue our sponsorship. I thoroughly miss coming up to Good City. It's one of my uh, favorite adventures to come up to. They always have such a good spread. Um, who remembers those tater tots? I mean, those things were amazing. Um, so thank you for keeping this going. We know that COVID is gonna probably be with us for a little while longer, unfortunately. Uh, nobody knew back in March that we would be here in this environment. So kudos to you all for continuing this important work. Um, planning and urban planning and those ideas are really the structure of good society. And uh, we are always just happy to support that. Educators Credit Union was founded by a group of like-minded teachers back in 1937. It was $5 to join the credit union back then, and it's still $5 to join now. So for you planners out there, I task you, can you find an organization that it was $5 to join back in 1937, and it's still $5 to join some 80 years later. So if you can find one, I'll buy your next beer at uh, Good City next year. So I just wanted to drop a quick thing into our chat box. One of the things that we really pride ourselves on at Educators Credit Union is financial planning and being financially empowerment of our members. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dana. I, I, did anybody design the hashtag you're muted shirt yet? I haven't seen one yet. I know it's coming. It has to be. Um, but thank you for that. Uh, so I dropped in the, the chat. It's our partnership with Bonsai. Uh, there are a ton of curated articles out here for you. It's free for you to use. You do not have to be a member to use these uh, resources. Um, just like uh, with most good information, it's just the right thing to do to share it. My personal favorite is some of the calculators that are out there. Obviously, I'm a huge numbers geek, uh, but for those of you that um, are thinking about retirement or thinking about a home or thinking about paying off some of your credit card, the calculators are really, really insightful. And please don't worry, all of the articles are less than a seven minute read. So we're not gonna bore you to death with a bunch of graphs and information that may not be appealing. So thank you again to the Alumni Association. Thrilled to be here. Can't wait to hear what everybody has to say. And thanks for having us. Awesome. Thanks, Victor. I think with that, we will roll straight into the presentation. So let's go. Uh, well, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you to the Alumni Association for having me speak today. Um, my name is Jenea Jackson. I'm a 2006 MUP grad, 
and I'm the Asset Management Division Director for HUD Multifamily based out of San Francisco, California. My team's area of responsibility is California, Oregon, Alaska, Nevada, Idaho, Guam, and the other Marianas Islands, and the Hawaiian Islands. HUD's mission is to provide safe and decent and sanitary housing. My division's responsibilities is to do exactly that for the HUD insured and project-based Section 8 multifamily housing. We're stewards of these programs to house vulnerable persons charged with monitoring, preserving our long-term investments as partners with tenants, property owners, and the management agents. I'm excited to share with you a very brief overview of HUD's approach to multifamily affordable housing preservation during the pandemic. Uh, many federal and local tools have been put in place to protect the houseless, renters, and owners. Uh, the CDC put together and uh, placed in put in place an eviction moratorium, and the federal government enacted the CARES Act, the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act. Very briefly, our charge is to help safeguard the housing of folks you see in these pictures. Uh, the CARES Act created a mortgage forbearance program and a COVID supplemental payments program. In my portfolio, we only have five properties out of 3,180. That's 0.1% of our properties who requested forbearance. Uh, we have over a thousand properties who've requested the CSP expense report reimbursement, uh, totaling over a $3 million reimbursement. Typically reimbursements are for PPE for staff and residents, um, additional technology to support doing business virtually, additional cleaning costs, things of that sort. Uh, rent losses are not an eligible CSP reimbursement expense and it's becoming an issue and for our FHA insured market rate properties, particularly in higher rent areas like California and Hawaii. Many owners and management agents, particularly in high cost cities with local and state eviction moratoriums like in California, have uh, started the tent, um, the tenants have started to stop paying their rent altogether. Uh, for our project based Section 8, uh, 202 programs, which are for very low income elderly and Section 11, very low income elderly and disabled. Um, they're very heavily subsidized, so they've seen a less impacts from the pandemic. Uh, this is uh, the last of the project Section 8 funds were funded in 1980s, so no new project have been added since then. Uh, preservation of existing subsidized units is critical to safeguard long-term uh, rental assistance. We use different tools to recapitalize affordable rental housing improve and modernize properties and put them on a solid financial footing. So this is Yapoa Terrace Retirement Apartments. It's one of our low income tax credit success stories during the pandemic. Yapoa means very high place in the native language of the Kalupuya tribe who inhabited the Williamette Valley prior to the arrival of European American settlers. Uh, we are really excited about this property because um, it did a, uh, with the funds for the rehab, it did uh, compliance with current accessibility and seismic codes and the replacement of worn out building systems to improve energy efficiency. Another good news story during the pandemic is Light Tree Apartments. It's a community in East Palo Alto. It was originally constructed in 1966 and it's currently under construction and being renovated. It's doubling the number of affordable, affordable homes that exist on the site today providing 185 affordable homes to low-income families, persons with disabilities, formerly homeless individuals, and foster youth. HUD will provide subsidies allowing the current housing assistance payment contract to be divided into two, and that's what made this deal financeable. Residents of the Lightshare Apartments will benefit from this program. Um, they're going to have uh, 35 supportive housing households um, they will have community garden, laundry rooms, play structures, basketball half court, and a shared outdoor space. So I'm very proud of my team and for the work we've been doing in our communities. Um, our fiscal year 20 achievements have been incredible. 94 subsidized preservation transactions we've completed. Um, and that's a total of 7,247 affordable housing units we've saved this year. Many of these properties have also undergone capital repairs and rehab to expend, extend the useful life of the buildings. Um, I'm also very proud that we did this with 100 fires burning between California, Oregon, and Nevada at the same time. We had a total of 481 properties were identified um, and being close proximity to these fires. And within 72 hours, our staff contacted and did outreach with these properties. Um, so our staff is fully committed to what we're doing. 
I'm just so happy um, that we've just been doing an amazing job. Uh, this is my shameless plug. If you're ever interested in coming to work for a HUD, we're gonna be advertising for, for positions um, in the upcoming months. So that's my time. I'll hand it over to Tim now. Hi everyone, I'm Tim Streitz. I graduated from the program in 2010. I've already seen a lot of familiar faces on the, the sidebar, so good to see you all. Um, I'm gonna talk about, well, I'm just kind of throwing a bunch of stuff that we're doing out there. Hopefully some of it resonates, um, but basically uh, I'm trying to do a connection between transit-oriented development and uh, the natural and built environment. So as you know, Hawaii's got a lot of natural features. When most people think of Hawaii, I think images probably come to mind of like secluded, uh, tropical, relaxing beaches and atmosphere. Uh, but as you can see here in Waikiki, which is the uh, main tourist destination in Honolulu, parts of the island are pretty urban. And I actually looked this up, but urban Honolulu is just a little bit less population density than Milwaukee. So you can see here, you know, we struggle with um, similar traffic related issues. This is rush hour on a freeway, but even throughout other times of the day, um, short commutes can take quite a while just because of the reliance on cars. And so um, to fix that, um, we're under construction with our first elevated rail transit system. The first section of it is anticipated to open for service this summer with the remaining sections um, being phased in. And this will be the first fully automated rail system in the US. If any of you are familiar with Vancouver, BC, it's the same type of system. So um, that's really the impetus for our TOD program. Uh, we anticipate 60% of the population, 90% of the jobs to be located along this 20 mile corridor. This is just showing how the stations are broken up into uh, planning areas. All the plans are done just in various stages of adoption. This is an example of one of the neighborhoods at the end of the line near Waikiki. It's uh, centered around the largest outdoor shopping center in the world, supposedly. And so um, we've seen a lot of development already occurring in this neighborhood. Uh, you can see kind of in the forefront there, a uh, park that's an existing park, very large and popular with the locals. This is another neighborhood that's centered around a stadium that the university plays in. And it's envisioned to become a mixed use entertainment district. And basically to achieve that, it'll be built over a surface parking lot that the state of Hawaii owns. And they own the majority of the land along the rail corridor. So we've been coordinating very closely with them on QOD. But most of the corridor is actually pretty urban. So we're anticipating a lot of infill to be the kind of driver for TOD. And this area just outside of our downtown is um, kind of an early focus area where we're anticipating and, and want to direct growth. Uh, it's got ideal conditions. And as you can see here, uh, you know, at build out, we anticipate a significant change. Um, and not only that, but from kind of the more industrial character to residential, which is particularly important here because uh, we really need to um, satisfy a lot of the housing demand. And so as part of our mixed use uh, zoning, we incorporate an inclusionary housing component and allow also developers to provide additional housing for bonuses. You can see, you know, we struggle with homelessness in part uh, due to the, the high cost of living. Uh, this is a canal that was in that same neighborhood from the previous slide. And um, we're anticipating a uh, new linear park that's envisioned as part of the TOD planning efforts. So this will help, we think, kind of satisfy some of the new residents' recreational needs. As you can imagine, uh, you know, it's an industrial area, so there's not a lot of park space right now, but we're currently working on this project uh, as part of like a catalytic project to help um, spur development. And as you can imagine, um, you know, to achieve the, the build out and vision and the COD plans, a lot of infrastructure investment will need to occur. This is a study we did a couple of years ago in that same neighborhood and identified about one and a half billion dollars worth of upgrades that are needed. You can see that kind of broken down by component there. But one of the more recent dilemmas we're kind of grappling with is sea level rise. And so this map is showing up to six feet that's projected by the end of the century. And we've been having these discussions, you know, whether to retreat or adapt to these areas. But um, you know, in these areas where rail is going, it's particularly important, I think, to adapt. And so we're kind of in the, the early stages now, um, you know, looking at these areas where 
significant investment has been already occurring and is planned. And so uh, we've been working with some consultants and looking at um, not only how to accommodate sea level rise on properties, but also accommodate it in TOD areas where you know we want to still ensure that there's that healthy pedestrian atmosphere, lively streets and so forth. So um, in anticipation of kind of a long process, um, well, there becomes like a differentiation between the different elevations on sites and, and the road. We're looking at these transition zones, which you can kind of see off to the right there, that vegetated area, hard to see the different elevation. But uh, this is an example in, a, in one of our neighborhoods just showing that you can still have you know, street trees providing shade and sidewalks up close to uh, storefront windows. And then lastly, just wanted to point out uh, a few other items that we're looking at, um, you know, as new buildings become, uh, go up around the rail stations, we got to consider the historic uh, character of the neighborhoods and try and preserve that, as well as the sight lines, which you can see, you know, down the street towards the mountains and, and try and make those visual connections. Thank you. All right, thank you. Yes, I am up. Uh, I am Dina Svetlik. I am the director of Urban Infill with Fisher Homes. I'm presently based in Denver, um, but I am um, this evening uh, on East Coast time. And I think all of us would like to be with Tim in Hon Honolulu right now. So um, a little bit about my background. My um, background started with an undergraduate degree in architecture at UW, and then I went on for the dual masters in architecture and planning. And then subsequent to that, um, in kind of the mid late uh, 2008 timeframe, I also obtained an executive certificate in real estate finance at the University of Denver. So um, I'm going to talk today about navigating a career. And I'm usually the one with, with images, and, and I really don't have any images today. So let's talk about navigating a career, um, five different elements. One is lifelong learning, secondarily, finding your niche, thirdly, changing your mindset, fourthly, knowing when to move on, and finally, the Black Panther. So lifelong learning, right? Um, learning does not end with the formal education. Um, the formal education provides that basic foundation for you to go out and really begin your career um, and start building the rest of the house, right? You got that solid foundation um, through the formal education, but then you really are learning so much more once you get out um, and start practicing. And then I think another key message for folks to also remember is that that lifelong learning is not only within your career, career. It's not just going to continuing education classes and, you know, the focus of your, your niche, which I'll get to, but it's also about staying involved and staying interested and, and um, uh, having curiosity uh, to continuously learn about different things in life. And I think that will only aid and help advance your career. So secondly, finding your niche, right? We all know that the planning field is broad. I'm sure you're hearing a lot about that. Um, right now within your studies. Um, so the question is, what have you been drawn to thus far? What has come the easiest to you? Um, you know, are you interested in policy? Are you interested in physical design, right? It's about finding your, your niche and, you know, what, think about right now, what are, what are the classes that really get you um, jazzed up and excited and get you out of bed every day to go to that class? Um, you know, some of that you may think too right now that you know what you want to go into, but after you start getting some experience, you might discover that you're more interested in going a little bit of into a different direction. So thirdly, changing your mindset. So this first bullet here is actually something that um, um, sort of a professional advisor mentor that I've been working with recently um, had mentioned to me, and he said that you get to do something, not have to do something. And thinking about things that way, really changing your mindset around doing something that you think is really mundane and not related to where your career is going is extremely important. And so changing your mindset to, hey, I get to do this, not I have to do this, can really make a difference um, even when you're doing those most miserable, miserable tasks um, at work. And then sort of related to this, these two other, um, the two other bullets on that, the last slide, I think it's important to note um, 
the power of observation. Um, you know, simply being in a meeting, being in an environment, no matter where you are, simply in, observe the environment, observe the people that you're meeting with, the people you're working with, um, the people that you're presenting to. So fourthly, knowing when to move on, right? Um, we all need to be in a position, you know, and really get the most out of that, um, really learn to your full potential in that particular position. But if you're starting to feel a little stagnant, um, that you're not really learning anything more, that you're not really um, moving on, you can look for opportunities within that same organization, perhaps to transition and, and grow further. Um, and sometimes it's, it just makes sense to move on and, and look for other opportunities in a new organization. And sometimes, um, you know, you're in an environment that might be a toxic environment um, or just not working in your niche and it's, and it's time to move on. So I guess the one thing I would say about that is that every single experience is a learning experience, whether it's positive or challenging, and often the most challenging experiences allow you to grow the most. And then lastly, the Black Panther, right? So taking a cue from UW, a Black Panther is something that's pretty rare. And so my advice to you is be rare, be your unique self, no matter what you're doing. That's it. All right. Awesome. Well, hi, everyone. Sarah Brigant here. I graduated in 2017 and then have been with the Northwest Side Community Development Corporation here in Milwaukee, uh, serving as a community development specialist ever since. Um, so I get to work on a lot of our planning and public space projects. Uh, a lot of those actually involve different types of green infrastructure, uh, different types of public space planning, um, a lot of really cool things. So let's get started. I do feel an obligation to start this with a cheers from Milwaukee or cheers to Milwaukee. Uh, we've heard from all around the country so far, but I get the chance to kind of bring it home to UWM's turf. So cheers, go Bucks. Let's have fun with it, right? So I do, I wanna talk about community engagement but first, stormwater. So flooding, we all know, is a big problem. Uh, flooding has been a big issue in Milwaukee's 30th Street Corridor, which is really in the heart of the north side of the city, where I get to go to work every day. And thankfully, though, we have some great partners that are working on this, uh, specifically the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewerage District, or MMSD. Um, they're really national leaders within stormwater management and green infrastructure. Um, so they've devised a way to address this flooding in the corridor with a series of three stormwater detention basins, uh, two of which you can see here. But the, the kind of cool part of it is we get to leverage these kinds of investments into neighborhood assets. And here we're looking at the third in the series of basins, the West Basin, which is the largest, uh, really has the most opportunity for adding different community amenities. And that's where Northwest Side CDC and my role comes in. Um, we're, we're really trying to figure out what neighbors want to see there and how to transform that space. So community engagement wise, we've heard a lot of this stuff a hundred times. I really don't want to bore you with some of the things like surveys and mapping and dot voting, you know, nothing against those things. We actually did all of those things within the last couple of years already. Um, but I wanted to spend some time today doing a, uh, talking about a couple outside of the box things we did. Uh, the first of which was making a big, I wish this was a board. And so we got this idea from an artist in New Orleans named Candy Chang, where she does something similar. She has stickers that say, I wish this was, and then sticks them to vacant buildings that are boarded up and then has Sharpie markers next to them and just really lets those ideas come in. So I contacted her, made sure it was okay to kind of steal that idea. She said, go for it. So we built our own sign, our own version of this, painted, I wish this was at the top. Um, left the waterproof stickers and markers out there and let the ideas come in. Uh, so we kept an eye on those uh, throughout the summer. We did different types of events with the board. One of them was a cleanup. Another was a neighborhood walk. Here you can actually see Mayor Tom Barrett filling out an idea on one of the stickers. And then we, of course, agglomerated those ideas onto this word cloud here that you'll see. So that was a really fun, visible way to get some ideas. Second, we hosted a farmer's market at the space. So this was actually an idea that came from some of our neighbors in the door-to-door -door and survey outreach that we did saying, hey, we want more opportunities to get fresh and healthy food access here. You know, we're in a food desert. 
So we were trying to think, we were like, you know what, let's just pilot this concept. Let's test that market demand and see if this could be a permanent part of the space. And so, you know, long story short, I'm going to breeze through it because we, it, I mean, it really was a lot of work, but we got a grant from the city's Fresh Food Access Fund, ended up getting 20 vendors to participate. Uh, we were out there for an afternoon in August. Uh, we paired it with uh, healthy cooking demonstrations. We were able to accept SNAP benefits, um, but ultimately just having people physically in that space was really key to the success of that site. And, you know, we hope bringing people there will give people an experience that, that they'll now know what this West Basin site is and what's possible there. And lastly, we did a series of bus tours with the residents that we work with who are live near the Basin site. Um, and the, the main point of this was, again, really to experience different types of uh, public spaces, parks, even other stormwater basins in the city, uh, and just experience those and try and think about what, how different types of amenities fit within spaces. Um, and really, again, that key of just physically being there and, you know, seeing how things like green infrastructure fit together with park amenities, playground, amen um, playground equipment, uh, all kinds of other stuff, trails, seating, benches, you name it. So that was all that was all really exciting. Um, you know, again, a, a lot of different we had a lot of fun with it. We had dinner afterward, uh, looking at how different spaces include public art in the conversation and how, how that gets woven into spaces to create a sense of place. Uh, and then we did a follow up tour. This was pre COVID, but we went to the Menominee Valley Urban Ecology Center and just looking again at the similarities where the Menominee Valley has reinvented itself. Um, and, and the Menominee Valley is very similar to the 30th Street Corridor in a lot of ways. So trying to take some notes and examples of how that transformation happened. So that is it. Um, you know, cheers again, I suppose. I'm, I'm around for questions. I know I flew through that pretty quickly, but um, yeah, cheers. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for our presenters. And we are happy to take any questions you might have now. Feel free to enter them in the chat, or I think there's a way you can raise your hand and we can call people out if you want to ask your question via video instead. Or if you just want to say hi to somebody you haven't seen in a while and you see them on the video, feel free. All right. So hey, 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 Sam, hey, Sam, how's it going? How's retirement? <laughs> You're on mute. You're muted. It's going well. I keep very busy uh, with a variety of things, including planning related. But it's nice having choices that are mine rather than all being determined what I have to do next. You mean Gene doesn't have uh, some chores for you around the house? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so. But I'm a bigger driver of those than she. Oh, all right. <laughs> so, well, I, um, I go back to the creation of the planning program. And I got to tell you, um, I am just totally blown away by the stuff that planning grads are doing these days. Sam, I think when we graduated, I never imagined that, you know, we'd have people scattered all over the Western Hemisphere doing some uh, pretty cutting edge stuff. I mean, this is the stuff that we could only dream of, and they're actually doing it. I'm so impressed. As am I. <laughs> I think it's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, and things we would, would not even have considered. We never... Never even <laughs> That's true because it, <laughs> Al Gore hadn't invented the internet yet. So, <laughs> all right. So, looks like we had a couple of questions come in. The first one is from Dan Adams to Tim. What's the timeline on the rail project in Honolulu? I was actually going to show this to Sam. It was propping up my laptop. Oh. <laughs> I brought this out here with me. <laughs> Very um, 
but yeah, very useful book. Um, the rail is supposed to begin operation this summer for the first half of it. And then the, the rest of it will be kind of phased in. They're hitting some uh, like unforeseen utility issues uh, near the, the downtown area. So it's delaying the project a little bit because of that, I mean the full completion. But uh, they're, they're supposed to be incorporating some kind of like express buses to connect um, the rest of the rail line in the meantime. Awesome. Not like any transportation project ever to get um, behind schedule, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah there, there's a lot of criticism for this one because it was supposed to be fully completed by now and um, it's over budget. And oh. A lot of stuff, but yeah. yeah. We're trying what we good. can on the, the neighborhood planning side of it. Right, right. That sounds really familiar to a lot of the transportation projects I work on, so. <laughs> Definitely not the only ones. Okay, so the next question is from Kyle for Jenea, um, asking about what different challenges you might see serving different areas like ha Hawaii, Guam, and the West Coast. Um, definitely, um, geographically, some of the problems that you see are like some cities, some states are more on top of um, like just affordable housing issues in general. So for example, in Los Angeles, like they have, um, a, they already have rent control. They already have, um, like they already had their own eviction moratorium before the CDC created the eviction moratorium. And so when you pivot to places like Idaho, like Boise, uh, where they're slow to get those things in play and um, really the property owners and, and, and real estate investors have um, more pull in those places, you see less protections in place. Um, and so you see, um, well, we get a lot of phone calls. <laughs> we got to get a lot of emails with, you know, funny business happening, frankly, in some of those places. And um, where we subsidize our projects, uh, HUD gets very involved in, in smoothing those things out and making sure that we're doing right by the residents. And, and then also that, um, you know, the owners are, are understanding that, uh, you know, we have an enforcement arm to what we do as well, and we can uh, cut off their subsidy if they don't play nicely. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, I don't see any more questions or hands up, but if anybody wants to shout something out or, again, um, say hi to anybody or start a little conversation, feel free. I know it's a lot with uh, um, so many people on the call. Oh, it looks like Sam might have asked one question. Anything particular you're excited about um, to be coming at HUD under, oh, sorry. Yes, I read that too. Okay, you did. <laughs> under our new uh, president. Uh, there's a lot to oh, be Oh, Secretary about. Fudge, okay. Um, there's a lot to be excited about. Um, in particular, I'm really happy <laughs> to see um, some of the rollbacks that are happening with the LBGTQ community and uh, rolling back, um, frankly, what were discriminatory policies uh, with, um, um, you know, our, our homeless and uh, subsidi uh, subsidized, our subsidized uh, homeless programs. So I'm really happy to see that being rolled back. Um, I'm also really happy to see uh, transportation and zoning reform getting tied together. Um, that's the way, particularly in the Bay, uh, where we just have an incredibly wealthy communities um, who are very, have a very strong NIMBY um, lobbying ability. And um, when people are stressed out, <laughs> spending long commutes, um, getting to work, they care very much about transportation. And now hopefully we can help them care a lot more about um, housing affordability and um, having, uh, you know, more uh, multifamily properties and in places that are frankly very, very wealthy. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited about uh, the prospects. And I think uh, what Biden's proposed has been pretty bold and I'm looking to see how that it all works out. Awesome. So we got a couple of questions back for Tim. One, and the most important really, what temperature is it currently in Hawaii? So we can all be envious. I think it's only about 77 degrees right now. Oh, only, <laughs> only he says. This is okay. our rainy season. So When's the last time you wore long sleeves, Tim? <laughs> I don't know, can't even, 
<laughs> remember. Yeah. Sometimes uh, the nights get a little chilly, but yeah. um, you know, that chilly for us, it's like 60s. So Tim, this is my own personal question. I'm going to throw in here before I get to um, the next one from Joe, but did you go out to Honolulu because you wanted to, or did you go for a specific job? Um, I was kind of just looking what was available at the time. I was just looking kind of out West, but then, um, you know, like California and then Hawaii, but I, I noticed the opportunity here in the planning department and saw the projects, uh, you know, that, that were going on. The, the previous mayor, we just had a, a transition to a new administration uh, this month, but previous mayor was very proactive. He's really kind of shepherded the um, reconstruct or getting going the rail project. It's been kind of in planning phases for a couple of decades, but uh, really getting it going and campaigning on that was, was under the previous mayor, but also um, the city, passed the complete streets ordinance and he's been very proactive in getting the transportation services department to put in new bike lanes and uh, take out, you know, lanes of roads where there's excess and um, sidewalk dining now. So there, there's just a lot of like exciting things going on. So um, that and like through bike share and it's been really exciting to work here. Awesome. So planning reasons, not just the weather. Uh, so yeah. the real question from Joe was, um, what led to the rail line being elevated? Um, obviously not a common feature in modern rail projects. Yeah, I'm not quite sure why they ended up on that. Um, but I think um, there, there's a similar thing. So we have, for some reason, what they call interstate highways here, even though it's not connecting any states but it's just, you know, falls under the classification of the federal highway system. But one of the highways, we have three on Oahu where Honolulu is located. One of them is basically on stilts and it has to do with um, ancient burials. So they're very sensitive to that culturally. And I think part of that might have to do with, um, you know, sections of, of the rail line. So it might've been just more effective overall to keep it elevated as well as just, you know, your um, off grade. So it, it provides opportunities like automating the system and uh, very consistent travel times. Awesome. Well, well, I still have you here. In regards to your uh, 2100 slide, has the politicization of climate change changed funding and planning for raised sea levels? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch all of it, but it was. Yeah. So in regards to your 2100 slide, has the politicization of climate change changed funding or planning for raised sea levels? Yeah, the, the previous mayor issued a directive so that all departments now have to factor in sea level rise as part of our work and policies and also our consultant work. So that's a pretty dramatic um, change. And so um, the, it's, it's very complicated, I guess. It's <laughs> easy to, to kind of like point to where the, the areas are impacted. We're you know, past that point, but now we're getting into these very complex situations where we're starting to introduce policy into planning documents, but um, kind of from that point forward it is really where the, the details hit. And so figuring out, um, you know, the, the balance between regulation and uh, kind of allowing more voluntary actions is, is where we're at. And I guess through a charter amendment in the last election, the, the voters created a climate change and resiliency office. And so they've been getting some funding, uh, but they're mostly focused on like a coordination role among the different departments and, and trying to shepherd in the, the new policies. Um, but we are looking at certain areas for kind of pilot projects and some of those are funded, but it's mostly just like local funded. We did get some EPA funding for like technical support and, and a team came out and looked at um, some greening of the streets. So in, in a few neighborhoods where there's stormwater issues, they were looking at that sort of thing, which I think could kind of like connect up with uh, sea level rise as well. But um, yeah, right now, 
I guess we haven't any major dedicated you know, funding source for starting to address this stuff. We're, we're relying, I think, a lot on uh, private developers voluntarily um, seeing the benefit of like raising their site. But then of course you have, you know, the side effects of that, like that we're kind of grappling with, like, you know, the runoff that might occur onto the adjacent properties and, you know, the ups and downs, like creating valleys between properties, um, you know, so it's, it's exciting and challenging, um, but yeah, hopefully we'll get some funding in the future for doing some good projects. Awesome, thanks, Tim. Um, so I have one question for Sarah from Andy. What's the next pop-up event you want to host at the West Basin? Awesome, yeah. So I know right now we're deep in the throes of winter and have a lot of snow on the ground. So I'm, I honestly wanna say like a winter theme pop-up you know, an idea would be to do like a snowman building contest or something like that, you know, kind of banking on how the weather shakes out. Um, the other idea would be to actually like flood the bottom of the north or east basins and do an ice skating rink. I think that would be a sort of cool idea. I think liability wise, MMSD <laughs> might get a little bit nervous about it, but I, I haven't been told an outright no yet. So I'm gonna at least keep clinging to that idea. And, you know, again, I mean, Wisconsin, we're, we're stuck with a lot, of, a lot of cold weather. So it would be nice to have a sort of four seasons approach to that space and have people start considering things as, as winter activities too. Um, so, I mean, with that, we could do like a snowshoeing or cross country skiing sort of, uh, you know, activity day, something like that. As, as summer rolls around though, we'd love to do the pop-up markets again Hopefully with, you know, maybe some of the worst of COVID behind us, we can have that a little bit nicer where it's a, you know, we have a DJ or something and have, have a live, live music, have people kind of hanging around. Um, so yeah, all kinds of opportunities. I'm, I'm open to ideas as well if, um, yeah, if, if people have anything for me. Awesome. Um, so Adam had asked a question earlier about just any examples of resiliency planning that people are doing. I think we could probably even open that up beyond the speakers, um, whether it's flooding or climate related issues. And I do not work on this at all, but I did want to mention that I thought it was really interesting just within the last couple of years, how many RFPs I'm seeing in Wisconsin for resiliency and sustainability plans that communities want. A lot of flood related issues, of course, over here, but I just thought it was interesting to note I don't know if anybody wants to take that one on. Otherwise, we got a question for Dana coming up too. I can add something. Uh, I'm Dan McAuliffe, uh, I guess, uh, 2005 uh, Masters of Architecture, Master's of Urban Plan grad, working for the city of Madison now. Um, in 2018, we had some pretty massive flooding. Um, it, it really landed, we had about say 12 inches of rain in like three hours um, on the west side. Um, it was very, very fortunate that it largely landed outside of the Mendota watershed. Um, but areas like Middleton, uh, uh, some of the other, the, the western areas, they just got hammered. Um, and we had some pretty, pretty major flooding. One person was killed uh, in that flooding. Um, but it basically shut down the isthmus. Um, and if people are familiar with the isthmus, so um, Madison, basically from the capital, about three or four miles east, it's a strip of land between two lakes, about a mile wide. Uh, basically, the lakes used to be one. It was a glacial deposit. Um, a couple areas are just above lake level. Um, and so what, actually what we had was the the levels of the lake had ridden so, risen so much that the storm sewers were actually backing up and filling the isthmus. Um, so we had some urban flash flooding and then the big lake drained to the small lake, the small lake uh, filled up the streets. Um, so we had a lot of emphasis looking at um, how do we approach that? We're doing a lot of watershed analysis. We have a new revised uh, stormwater ordinance that was just passed, basically eliminating any credits for existing conditions. You know, previously, if you did a redevelopment, you had to, you basically just couldn't increase impermeability. That's gone. Um, 
So really forcing green roofs. Uh, we're also looking at what we can do within our right of way um, to try to capture um, additional stormwater bioswales in the streets. Um, other thing, thinking about with the isthmus going back there, we're looking at, you know, what are the finished floor levels at grade? Um, the water table is already too low. There, we can't do underground parking in those areas. Um, but, you know, we're thinking about, you know, as redevelopment is occurring, which is occurring very rapidly, um, you know, making sure those floor levels are elevated to withstand future flooding. So it's, it's a process. We're going through that quite a bit. Um, we're doing, right now, our big project is with the uh, Kind of redevelopment and revisioning of the city's regional malls and that's a huge topic that is really being addressed through that process. Awesome thanks for sharing Dan. Uh, question for Dana from Carolyn. Um, she says how do you combine your skills with a private developer? Are those different from public sector and consulting jobs? Right so um, I know, so I literally just joined um, Fisher Homes in the last about month and a half, um, formally as an employee. And prior to that, I was a consultant to them um, since August of this past year. And so um, most of my career has been in private consulting, but I've also been in the, in the public sector and the public sector side of things and community development. Um, and in terms of the consulting world, consulting for cities, consulting for developers, consulting for um, housing agencies, et cetera. So this transition, um, I think it was sort of timely in terms of my navigating a career theme for, uh, for you all this evening. So this position is really bringing together, I think, all of the skills that um, started out with that foundation that I talked about in terms of you know, the formal schooling as well as all of the experience over um, now 30 years of, of working in the industry. And so this particular position is a brand new position in the company. We are a um, more traditional home builder, which is an environment I never thought I would ever be in, but they are launching, they have just launched an infill division. And so they created a new position, director of urban infill and brought me on board to lead that, uh, that division. Um, and direct those efforts. So it's really bringing together everything from my strong background in urban design and site planning to understanding of architecture and, and residential, um, residential building and my passion and focus on missing middle housing. Um, and then and also bringing in some of the development finance components um, through my subsequent education at the University of Denver. So this has really been um, a fantastic opportunity. It's um, it's going to mean a, a big relocation for me, uh, the biggest one in over 20 years. Um, but it's a fabulous opportunity to help this company grow and, um, you know, start building uh, both the townhouse and a narrow single family detached uh, home product. So I'm very excited. Hey, Dina. So will you still do engagement, like public engagement, just from a different perspective? Or is that not in your role? Sure. So there's uh, there's a specific land development um, a group. It's a, another another affiliated company. They literally they lead the the entitlement um, side of things, um, and but I'm I'm getting more and more involved with them, I'm helping them uh, learn more about the the infill product and different nuances of entitlement and infill and redevelopment contexts versus greenfield contexts. Um, so I'm, I'm literally just at the, the beginning cusp of that. And um, so there hasn't been a lot of engagement yet. We literally have uh, one, you know, some of our first projects um, just beginning to go through the entitlement process right now. Um, so, so yet to be determined on that, but I've also, you know, part of my initial work um, that started when I was a consultant with them um, is, is putting a playbook together, an entire playbook on urban infill um, and this, uh, that product collection. And literally that was just launched this week. And one of the components in that uh, was how to write a good project narrative for an entitlement submission. <laughs> awesome. 
Awesome. Thanks, Dana. I think we'll have time for maybe one more question. And I think this is maybe one that we could all learn something from. So Sarah, this came from Sam, who I know works in Mount Pleasant. So a little bit of a suburban community. He's asking, many planners would kill to have somebody under 40 come to a public meeting. Um, how did events that pull from a wide variety of ages, including children, change your perspective on public outreach in the corridor? Yeah, and that's that's an awesome question. And I mean, honestly, anyone could could totally jump in on this as well. But I think it just stresses the importance and outlines the importance of getting all ages of feedback and input into how we're designing a space, um, and not just thinking about you know middle aged or elderly able bodied people. I mean, there's a lot of things that we need to be considering within the design of public spaces so that our cities uh, work for and serve everybody. But I mean, it's it's been so interesting engaging with kids in other ways as part of this project. Um, I did a tour of the, the North Basin not too long ago with a group of students and I'll never forget this question. It was, um, you know, as we're thinking about the ways that MMSD proceeded with designing a solution to flooding, right? So when I ask a, ask a 10 or 12 year old that question and the, the question that I got was, well, did they consider instead of, you know, digging a hole and having water fill up in this basin, what about just having like a big dome over the whole city, you know, and just protecting us from, from the elements, from storms and everything. And I was like, this is why engineering cuts off the creative process too hard. And I just, I was like, this is, this is, a, this is something that we need to be considering as planners, not, you know, maybe seriously, but really just thinking outside of the box and not being able to accept the sort of confines of status quo and reality. Um, so that that's something that's, that's kind of always going to stick with me. But we did a lot of other youth activities. You know, if you get a classroom of students, if you're engaging with a school, um, we got students in fourth grade to help plant some trees at their school and then plant uh, some rain gardens. So that was, you know, the the adult volunteers did a lot of the hard labor as far as removing turf grass and clayey soils, um, but the kids got to plant a lot of the native plants. And it's, I mean, it's really cool to see stuff like that and especially things that can grow and last for, for future years. And, you know, kids who are going to that school for multiple years can see that kind of development. And, and I think that's just really special. And it's something that our profession gets to deal with on a daily basis. So I just, I hope no one takes that for granted in some of these long-term plans and, and the impact that it has on, on people, especially as they age. So, but yeah, I mean, if anyone else had any, you know, comments or thoughts on, you know, engaging all ages, um, certainly feel free to jump in. I'll jump in again. One of the things that we've been doing since uh, the pandemic, actually in, in a certain ways, the pandemic has been really great for our public outreach because it forced our city attorney to let us do online engagement. So that was, that was really great. Um, a couple of things have really been helpful is we've started effectively doing all of our community engagement meetings twice. We've done them at lunch and we've done them in the evening. Um, and we've found our lunch meetings get a far higher attendance and a far younger attendance. Um, I think it's easier to get people's attention, you know, when they're sitting at their computer over lunch um, than it is to pull time away from their, when they're at home, especially if they have kids, right? They can't come to a meeting. So that's been really helpful. Actually, I was, we had a presentation tonight as a follow-up to our earlier presentation during the day. And it was 30, it was a third of the attendance and they were all like 65 plus. So changing the time and, and, and doing it over, that's been a big help for us. Yeah, thanks for sharing, Dan. I think we're all always looking for um, different input on virtual engagement. And I do think there's a lot of situations where virtual engagement sometimes works better, or at least having a virtual option in addition to in person. So that's great. Well, we are like coming up right on eight o'clock. And I know we uh, basically said that the meeting was going to be from seven to eight. Um, so our formal presentation is over. If anybody wants to leave, feel free to sign off. If anybody wants to stay and chat with people, um, feel free to use the Zoom meeting. Um, the floor is yours. But thank you so much to our presenters again, um, to Educators Credit Union for sponsoring this event, um, to Good City Brewing, and everyone on the committee that helped put this on. Um, we all appreciate it.
<laughs> virtual clap, virtual cheers. Thanks.